morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Pranya and I'm with the Ananta Center. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this very special session under our program, the Ambassador Series, a unique platform set up by the Center for interaction with heads of foreign missions in India and Indian missions abroad. It is an honor to have His Excellency, Mr. Vikram K. Durai Swami, High Commissioner of India to Bangladesh with us today to share his vision of the Indian-Bangladesh relationship and its future. A very warm welcome to you, High Commissioner. I would also like to welcome our chair for this very important session, Dr. Norshad Forbes, Chairman and Antaspin Center and Co-Chairman of Forbes Marshall. Dr. Forbes, as always, it is a real pleasure to have you with us. We really look forward to a fascinating and insightful conversation. With this, may I now request Dr. Forbes to take over. Thank you. Thank you, Pranya, and good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone, and a special welcome to our High Commissioner, uh, Mr. Vikram Dorasamy. Uh, Vikram, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, we believe that the relationship with Bangladesh is one of our most important relationships. It's one of our uh, treasured relationships. It's a relationship that we believe we can uh, build on for our uh, for our connected and joint prosperity as countries. Um, and it's a relationship uh, that uh, we're delighted you are now in charge of, uh, because uh, we believe uh, you can bring to fulfillment uh, the potential that exists in this, uh, this connection. Uh, I'll make very few introductory comments and then just set up how we're going to organize the session. Um, you know, one of the you know, when Bangladesh, Bangladesh is celebrating, as everyone knows, its 50th anniversary of independence uh, this year. And when Bangladesh started out as an independent country, uh, the term, the very actually inappropriate, as it turned out, term that was used to describe Bangladesh then was basket case. Uh, this was a very, uh, uh, a very evocative term uh, and actually a wrong term that was used at the time uh, by some world leaders. Um, and if you look at what's developed over these 50 years, we've seen Bangladesh move ahead rapidly in economic terms, in social terms, uh, first passing Pakistan, uh, the country that it had broken off from, um, and in more recent years, passing India in terms of its overall economic well-being. Uh, Bangladesh is now slightly richer than India in per capita GDP terms. Uh, Bangladesh has uh, the world's second largest garment industry, uh, which uh, has been growing very rapidly and has really transformed the fortunes of the country. Uh, Bangladesh has passed Pakistan first and then again India uh, in social indicators. Uh, the average Bangladeshi can li lives, I believe, three years longer than the average Indian, five years longer than the average Pakistani. Uh, the average literacy level uh, in Bangladesh is higher than the average literacy level in India. Uh, the average level of female literacy in Bangladesh is higher than the average level of female literacy in India. Uh, if you look at women's participation in the workforce, uh, 36% of uh, women of the workforce in Bangladesh uh, is women, uh, up from 3% at independence. I mean, these are dramatic gains. Um, and at 36% of the workforce, again, it's well ahead of uh, what we have in India. So there's so much that is impressive about Bangladesh's performance in these 50 years, so much uh, that, uh, that I think there is for us to also learn from in terms of their experience. One of the most striking things is the emphasis I mentioned the garment industry in Bangladesh. 80% uh, of Bangladesh's exports uh, are garments. Uh, and one of Bangladesh's interests uh, is to actually diversify its manufacturing base away from garments. Um, and they look very strongly to India to help them do this, to help them move away from this overwhelming reliance on the garment industry. Uh, and this creates great opportunities for Indian industry and for India to be much more actively engaged in Bangladesh, uh, in investment, uh, in trade, uh, in economic relationships more broadly. Uh, to address many of these great 
potential connections between India and Bangladesh. Uh, we're delighted to have with us uh, today our High Commissioner in Dhaka. Uh, Vikram, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Um, we all look forward to your comments and a brief final comment in terms of logistics. Uh, Vikram would speak for uh, a few minutes for about uh, 20 minutes in terms of uh, uh, giving us his picture of our relationship. And we've particularly spoken about talking about the relationship more in terms of potential and taking a forward look at our relationship as opposed to a backward look at our relationship. So looking forward, looking at what is to come, what we can do, uh, you know, the, 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 the title of the session, you know, a connected destiny, the focus on destiny um, is really what we would like to explore in our session today. After that, uh, uh, Vikram and I will have a conversation for a, for, a, for a few minutes, and then we will take uh, questions from the floor, and Pranya will collect the questions and send them, send them to, to me, uh, as she always does so efficiently. So Vikram, greatly looking forward to your comments and to a very engaging conversation. Thank you again for being with us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Forbes, and thank you to the Ananta Center for this valuable opportunity to participate in this uh, very interesting and aptly named platform. Um, it's of course a timely opportunity, as you correctly said, we are in the 50th year of India-Bangladesh ties, 50 years of Bangladesh's liberation, the centenary of the birth of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and of course, now 75 years of India's independence. I would like to set this conversation, my, my opening remarks, into two broad portions. One portion, for those who should know, what has actually been achieved in the last uh, 50 years, and more particularly in the last decade or so. And the second, the bit that we were talking about, the futuristic bit. So let me begin by saying that if uh, the UK and the US could often be described as one country divided by a language, Something similar can also be said about India and Bangladesh. Here too, we are two countries with common heritage, common culture, even a common root language, and in fact, a common official language. And yet we are divided in many ways by, uh, by history, which is something that gives us a baggage that we carry forward sometimes disproportionately heavily. It adds, becomes actually excess baggage on the, on the ship of state. But decade, decades of patient diplomacy and sustained leadership level statesmanship have shown that we can actually transcend or cut the Gordian knot of many of our inherited problems that in a sense uh, were consequent upon the birth of Bangladesh in 71. We need to recognize that this is no mean achievement. Often we tend to accept as a given that which we have received and we find it difficult to recognize what, what steps of uh, statesmanship it has taken to come to those points. The most obvious of these obviously is the uh, resolution of our land boundary. Uh, remember, it required not only parliamentary consent on both countries, but it actually involved the physical handing over of territory. In other words, from the Indian side, 111 enclaves with a total area of uh, 17,160 acres. And on the Bangladesh side, transferring to us 51 acres with an area of 7,100 uh, acres, right? So we are essentially talking about having redrawn the, uh, the, the land boundary and actually transferred bits of territory to each other. We've resolved peacefully a maritime boundary dispute. We have even, despite all the complexities, successfully put in place and maintained a river water agreement on one of our most important of the two main river, river systems that uh, three main river systems that uh, unite our two countries. So, you know, this process has also helped us address what in another context we have called the hesitations of history. Uh, we've had our share of hesitations of history here too. And these sort of foundational major transformative agreements have helped us actually revisit the relationship in a positive sense. The marking of this milestone year is another one of those major opportunities because it has actually given us a chance to give the Bangladesh war the attention that it deserves, not just in India, 
and indeed, of course, not just in Bangladesh, but beyond the region, even worldwide. Because this is something that I think Indians also need to recognize. This was truly a people's war. This was a war in which the non-elite portions of the population, which in 71 was by far the majority, actually stood up, picked up a gun, or picked up whatever they had to hand to defend their families, their homes, their, their kin, and indeed their way of life. It was not an elite level uh, sort of process, very much a people's war. And it was a successful military campaign by the Mukti Bahini and with finally with the Indian, the Indian Army's intervention after 4th of December, primarily because the people had stood up. So it's important for us in India also to contextualize it. Yes, there has been uh, a, uh, a sort of, there had been an effort after 75, after the assassination of Bangabandhu to try and turn things around. But today, I think those fundamental questions of identity have now been broadly addressed in Bangladesh. They're not completely addressed, but I think it is possible now to see a confident sense of identity in Bangladesh, which we need to engage with. We in India sometimes are also guilty of not having kept up with the pace of thinking in Bangladesh, where the sense of Bangladeshi identity now is, is a given. We don't need to make that point to them anymore. And with it comes an increasing and natural sort of appreciation for our role as, as a people in the support for Bangladesh in its liberation war. So uh, to that foundational structure, I would add recollection of history as one of the very important transformations that has taken place along with the land border, along with the maritime boundary, along with efforts to work on river water sharing, which is a, a fundamental change that, that we have before us. Obviously, with it has also come uh, both as cause and effect, the points that you made, that Bangladesh has succeeded well beyond their own initial aspirations and certainly beyond what the rest of the world had uh, cast in mind for it. I think that has also contributed to a great sense of national confidence and, and uh, national uh, assertiveness, which is a good thing. It enables us to deal with a Bangladesh that is, that is confident, standing on its own feet, a partner to all, which is a good place for our neighbors to be in. And I think, therefore, we are today at a point where we can see significant changes in four or five major metrics. One, trade and commerce. Today, it is, of course, our largest trading partner in South Asia, with uh, more or less consistently uh, $10 billion in total trade over the last three to four years. We have provided for almost a decade duty-free, quota-free access to Bangladeshi goods into India, but we haven't collectively done well enough to try and actually tap into the opportunities that the trade relationship has offered us. This has begun to change. It's not changing fast enough, but it's begun to change. In the last three years, if you narrow down on the statistics of Bangladesh's exports to India, India has been the, in the top two and now the top Asian trading partner of Bangladesh. We are, in other words, the biggest, already the biggest market for Bangladeshi goods. And indeed, we could be much bigger as and when uh, some degree of uh, anti-export bias reduces in the Bangladesh economy. And of course, the facilities for trade and investment are improved by both sides, including the infrastructure for trade and the regulatory environment for trade. Um, the short point, however, is that connectivity and the regulatory environment are going to be critical in ensuring that we leverage the opportunities that the commonalities of our economic systems uh, cultural preferences offer us as the basis for a bigger trade relationship, which brings me to the point about connectivity. This is, of course, a prerequisite for trade, fairly obviously. We have done fairly poorly collectively in this regard. It is extraordinarily difficult and time consuming to move goods between India and Bangladesh, even today. It is cheaper and faster for both India and Bangladesh to ship goods to Germany than it is to ship goods to each other give you the example of my own container with the uh, which of my own personal effects it it took between september 26th and november 9th for the container to travel and it traveled via from delhi via pipavav to port klang to chittagong it is the modern day equivalent of traveling uh, from uh, bangalore to uh, to uh, nagpur via kanpur it completely makes no sense and you know, rectifying this is a critical part 
of how we will transform the trade system in both countries. You don't have to take my word for it. The World Bank in its latest study suggested that if trade logistics were improved, uh, Bangladesh's exports to India would rise by 192%, and Indian exports to Bangladesh would increase by 120%. Trade logistics and the improvement of trading alone would give Bangladesh a 19% increase in its GDP. So, you know, the point is that improved connectivity, contrary to this being some sort of vast Indian scheme just to benefit itself, actually benefits both countries, and disproportionately it will benefit Bangladesh more. That said, trade connectivity has been a steady, if, if not spectacular, uh, upward trend. In the last decade, we've increased the number of ICPs that have set, been set up. We are working on improving land custom station. And more importantly, we have started the well overdue process or long overdue process of diversifying from land to, uh, from, uh, from road to rail and from road and rail also to include uh, inland waters and coastal shipping. If you get this right, the opportunities for more economically viable, more environmentally efficient trade, uh, trade logistics is at hand, and we need to grab this. This is, also a, uh, this is also facilitating greater movement of people. In the BC era, and by this I mean before Corona, uh, we had actually as many as uh, 2.8 million people traveling from Bangladesh to India uh, using trains, buses, and air services. We were on the cusp of increasing air services and train services, as well as bus services, to connect up the north also, until of course Corona came in and stopped everything. Now, unless we do this, we have we are losing out on the opportunity that the relationship sets before us. A third area where where major transformation has happened and quietly has been the energy sector, uh, almost sort of under the radar screen. Today, Bangladesh buys 1160 megawatts of electric power generated in India and is a keen demander of the opportunity to source electric power uh, from Nepal and Bhutan as well. And indeed, for, uh, it is now a votary of the idea of sub-regional uh, power arrangements. So our cross-border electric, uh, electric power guidelines uh, and uh, the regulatory system that has been put in place is a critical piece of creating better energy infrastructure across the region. We are building a friendship, uh, what is called the friendship pipeline to supply diesel from Siliguri to Parvatipur in the northern part of Bangladesh, which will affect considerable savings, uh, both of product and of cost, uh, as well as time in supplying the northern part of Bangladesh with high speed diesel. And the opportunities, including for LNG pipelines, for LPG to be bottled in Bangladesh and be shipped to Tripura, all of these are colossal. It, what it requires now is the next level of uh, infrastructure building and regulatory uh, changes, which will transform the oil, transform the relationship. Um, a fourth string to our bow, I would say, has been the development partnership. Today, Bangladesh is our biggest development partner. Uh, out, of, out of the uh, uh, nearly um, uh, $30 billion of uh, concessional credit that we offer globally, Bangladesh occupies approximately 27% of, uh, of our lines of credit. Uh, we have struggled initially to move forward our lines of credit spending, uh, basically trying to get our systems to be able to speak to each other, which is no easy achievement in bureaucratic terms in, with, between any two countries. But there has been a steady uptick even during the corona period uh, in which spending has actually increased. The focus of these lines of credit, and it's important that people know this, these are not only the largest lines of credit that we're offering any country, but they're also our cheapest. It is at a flat 1% rate of interest, which is competitive and comparable with what JICA offers and what the ADB uh, offers, offers. So, you know, this is beyond the normal, uh, normal sort of lines of credit that we offer. And it's important to recognize that this too can have a transformative value in terms of helping build the necessary infrastructure for the future. Finally, there is also, of course, the training component in which we're trying to reconnect uh, bureaucracies, uh, military, uh, militaries through service-to-service -service diplomacy or service-to-service uh, -service contact, I should say, government-to-government uh, -government contact with the intention of rediscovering ways in which we can, as you said, learn from each other. 
there are appropriate learnings that we can also take from how Bangladesh has succeeded, including through microcredit, through women's empowerment programs, through technology, appropriate technology solutions, uh, through the empowerment and parallel working with some very, very fine NGOs that have done brilliant work in Bangladesh, like BRAC, for instance. Each of these is an opportunity. Now, having said that, I would say today our glass is really half full. The question really is, what do we do to take it to the next level? And I would say the, the key challenges here are in really, first of all, changing our mindset. We in India need to start looking at Bangladesh much more as an opportunity for us uh, beyond just a political or a strategic relationship. We need to diversify our relationship naturally through the en uh, enhancement of the economic content of the relationship. It is it is an uh, sort of it is axiomatic that today's Bangladesh is already since it is a it is a rapidly developing economy. It is in in any case searching for partners. Who more appropriate than us, given that we are at a similar stage of development? We have, of course, the larger uh, economic scale, and we have the cultural and uh, sort of historical experience of dealing with similar systems. It makes sense for us to be here in a much bigger way. Not that we're not. According to the Bangladesh Investment Authority, uh, there are something like 350 Indian companies present in Bangladesh, registered with something like three and a half billion dollars of FDI stock uh, deployed in Bangladesh. Even in the Corona year, we've, uh, we were in the top five or top eight, uh, depending on how you count it, uh, investors in Bangladesh last year. So money is coming in. But what needs to come in is in a much more focused way, targeting sectors where there is an immediate benefit to both countries. For instance, in light engineering, in machinery, in automobile components, Bangladesh is very keen to move on to the next sector, uh, the next stage in automobile, uh, in automobile, in its automobile policy, in food processing, in fisheries. Each of these has an immediate um, knock-on effect on employment generation, and of course, pharmaceuticals. Bangladesh today still, as an LDC, has the opportunity to export generic uh, drugs to to the developed world, in particular the U.S. market. Now, obviously. A fair number of uh, Bangladeshi pharma companies are still importing APIs from India. So there is still an opportunity for us to leverage Bangladesh's market and as well as its, as well as its uh, productions, uh, production capacities to actually step in in these four or five sectors, establish partnerships or indeed uh, straight up investment to actually benefit from the scale at which this country is growing. It is immensely preferable for us to be here in a bigger way in this market. And that visibility needs to be enhanced. Uh, SEPA, uh, our comprehensive economic partnership agreement with an investment chapter, which we're working on, will be a game changer. We need to be able to move this forward by recognizing that, uh, you know, it has to be something where not only are there gains for us, but there should be visible gains for the Bangladeshi side in terms of at least securing the benefits that they have currently enjoyed in our market and by encouraging them to look at the Indian market, including as an opportunity for them to also come in through JVs, investment, et cetera. Connectivity. We must consistently, including through the private sector, invest in facilitation of trade. This is not going to come by just sitting around and waiting for the two governments to do, do the needful. Uh, there is space today for private container terminals. There is space today for uh, logistics operators it really makes sense for us to be here in a very big way, specifically in the logistics sector. Um, Bangladesh, as a country of 170 million people in a very densely populated country, is very well located for a range of railway related services, but also for inland water services, which is in a sense recapturing its historic uh, sort of uh, role, both in the Mughal period and in the British period as the Singapore of South Asia, if you will. Um, energy connectivity. We really need to look at energy as a future future driver of Bangladesh's uh, of of regional partnership. Bangladesh is um, not an energy surplus country. Obviously, its gas reserves are modest, and it makes sense for us to be part of the solution in providing affordable. Be one of the solutions, I should say, in providing affordable and reliable access to uh, gas and electric power 
and also in connecting up the sub region so that Bangladesh has the opportunity to also export power, including to our Northeast, as well as to, to our mountain uh, neighbors, Nepal in particular, where there is an opportunity, depending on the season, for power to flow across both ways. And therefore, investment in transmission infrastructure is also going to be critical. Uh, finally, looking at our development partnership, so far it has largely been G2G LOCs, but there is an opportunity increasingly to look at PPP partnerships with, in which Indian uh, project exporters could come in, help through the strength of their balance sheets, uh, access better quality funding, cheaper funding, and help in the development of infrastructure as Bangladesh also pivots away from uh, you know, excessive dependence on um, foreign loans for development. So, you know, Bangladesh, uh, and I should have said this earlier, has been one of our, one of the most impressive performers in terms of its borrowings globally. If you look at it, Bangladesh has consistently maintained a very low debt to G GDP uh, ratio. It has consistently ensured that it has been able to repay all its debts. And therefore, if anything, it is a conservative borrower. It is not a, it is by far from being a, a profligate borrower. And a good sign of that is in the fact that Bangladesh has, for the first time, lent money from its uh, central bank uh, through, a, through a swap arrangement to Sri Lanka. So the Bangladeshi uh, business environment or the Bangladeshi infrastructure environment actually constitutes a pretty good investment opportunity. And therefore, Indian project exporters and Indian financial sector uh, partners really need to look at Bangladesh as an opportunity in that direction. My last point, the future is going to be determined, or our future relationship is going to be determined by how far we can, we can reignite the uh, sense of um, opportunity that the youth will find when they look at each other. To drive this, it is important to recognize that both countries, the youth is increasingly borderless. They don't necessarily see themselves as being confined to a purely South Asian context. So creating opportunities for startups, for, uh, for, uh, for tech-based uh, collaborations, indeed for, for, for us to be partners in the improvement of the Bangladesh stack so that Bangladesh can also rapidly scale up in terms of uh, fintech and in terms of the opportunities to look at um, providing new digital, uh, you know, using the digital domain as a means of the next level of transformation of its poverty alleviation programs is going to be critical. These are all sectors in which we're working and I don't want to take more time by, by elaborating on all of this, but on each of these sectors, startups, um, energy, um, connectivity, um, new partnerships for development and trade and investment, these are things that we're trying to prioritize now. And COVID permitting, we hope that Indian business will particularly pay heed and enable us to really make the next uh, 365 days of this special year a truly meaningful pivot opportunity for us to start seeing the glass genuinely as half full. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vikram. Thank you for those comments that, uh, as, as completely promised, were, uh, were forward looking, were uh, wide ranging. Um, and really uh, point us in the direction that we must move in in this relationship. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me let me start with a question uh, around trade. And you know, some of some of what you said just now was quite striking. Um, and uh, uh, you know, you talked about the SEPA that we're currently uh, discussing. Now, um, how do we fast track this? How do we uh, move the uh, the you know a free trade agreement with Bangladesh up the priority ladder for both India and Bangladesh, um, you know such that you know what would we at present we do as you mentioned provide duty free access to uh, most Bangladesh most goods from Bangladesh. Uh, I think it's over ninety percent of all uh, tariff lines. Um, ninety seven. Okay, <laughs> so percent of all tariff lines. Um, and so, you know, what would be, what would make it attractive for Bangladesh uh, to seek this out? And what would make it attractive for us to prioritize it also in our, in our discussions at the highest level of government? Um, one, of the, one of the points that I've just sort of heard from friends in Bangladesh is um, they sometimes struggle with investment in India. They, uh, that there is 
something that comes in the way of them being treated, um, say, as similarly as, a, as an investor from Sri Lanka would be treated. Um, and I'm not entirely sure, but maybe you could also talk about uh, about that, because there seems to be these are these are these are perhaps easy easy wins to move us uh, along in this uh, in this relationship. Um, and maybe a, a last a last uh, pointer. You know, you you made the point that we're in the we're, we at, that India has been consistently in the top five or eight uh, investors in Bangladesh, and I was worried by that. I was. I would, I would, I would like to see us be the top investor in Bangladesh uh, consistently year on year. So, and as would you, I'm sure. So, so you know, what would that take? You know, so, so, uh, what would you like to see us do as industry? You know, in terms of our own interest in Bangladesh and activity in Bangladesh. Thank you. That's a that's a lot of questions to unpack. But sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. These are I good picked questions. Up, I picked up one questions. or two from the floor as well. <laughs> No, no, great. These are great questions. And let me begin by saying, look, fast tracking the SEPA hmm. on our side, as I understand from our own government, it's already a priority. It is in the top priority. now. So we are certainly keen to move ahead. Uh, the study has been commissioned and hopefully will give its findings, the formal study uh, fairly soon. Um, but the study apart, we broadly know what we need to do. So on our side, I think we're pretty clear about what is what is important uh, for us. And the SEPA is certainly a critical priority. On the Bangladesh side, well, look, right now, it isn't an immediate priority for the obvious reason that till they graduate out of LDC status, they have a DFQF access to your market. So yeah. that is, uh, you know, obviously a time, uh, how should I put it? It's a, it's a timeline issue which doesn't immediately impact upon them. But Ideally, we should be able to link the two and move from seamlessly from there to, to, uh, to a SEPA regime, from the point where Bangladesh graduates to a SEPA regime in a way that is beneficial to both countries. So Bangladesh must see a benefit from, from capturing its existing benefits and having that transition into a new regime, which sustains their benefits to the best level possible. Now, for us to be able to sell that argument, which is a reasonable argument, it's important also for us to address a number of issues that exist on the Bangladesh side in the trade relationship. Many of these are really not major issues and all they require is consistent attention and a willingness to try and fix these details. Uh, I must say the, uh, the Commerce Ministry, in, in particular the current Commerce Secretary, has been extremely forward-looking in saying that we must find such opportunities. And the minister has been very forward looking also on this. So I'm sure that if we paid the kind of attention that it deserves, we will be able to build essentially to use a somewhat hackneyed word, trust that a, a stronger trade relationship an institutionalized trade relationship will benefit Bangladesh, right? So given the backgrounds and the hesitations of our history, as I suggested, it is a bad idea for us to leave small issues and let them fester. Mm -hmm. So moving to a SEPA regime, to, in my, my mind, can easily be started the moment we can start clearing up the underbrush of some fairly small trade-related issues that, that continue to uh, agitate Bangladeshi traders, right? Um, the second part of it is that we really need to look in a much more constructive way at getting out the statistics and the, the reality of our trade relationship. Uh, for instance, while it is true that there is a significant imbalance between India and Bangladesh in, in trade. Uh, we export, uh, you know, over $8 billion worth of goods to Bangladesh and they export about $1 billion worth. So it's, you know, uh, very skewed in our favor. Uh, almost 25% of their sourcing of cotton uh, comes from India. So, you know, and, you know, cotton is not a commodity that that is consumed directly, right? I mean, you add value to it. Uh, and when you add value to it and you turn it into fire, fabric or yarn and then con convert it into RMGs, you're adding significant value, which really fetches the significant uh, dollar price in terms of export. So if you take the totality of our trade relationship, it is uh, of the totality of Bangladesh's trade relationship, it is not so badly skewed. Uh, but of course, that sounds like relativism to Bangladeshi years. So I'm not 
focusing purely on that point. But it's important for us to at least try and unpack some of these things and make it clear that not all of our exports are, uh, are products that are contributing to sort of a capital outflow. Mm. In fact, they're contributing to capital inflow because these are um, sort of foundational goods or intermediary goods that are essential for Bangladesh's export industry. There are sectors that could be further tapped, but for those, there are things that need to be done. That includes food safety arrangements, which I've been chasing for the last one year, uh, so that we can actually have mutual certification of food safety laboratory standards. I think we're close to that now, which would then open up the prospect of Bangladesh processed food industry products going to India and vice versa. So all of this is, is in the pipeline, and I think it will help build confidence. So the short point is that, I, you know, the SEPA will happen, but it is in our interest to try and make it happen faster yes. and in a way that includes Bangladesh's benefits and captures them and takes them through. So that is the bit that uh, the, the crafting of it, of course, I will leave to the Commerce Ministry. Which is, <laughs> sure. which is their job, but uh, how they bring stakeholders on board, etc., is going to be critical. Now on investment, I, there are two parts to this. You're right. Until fairly recently, we had... Uh, for reasons that I'm not sure anybody can explain, Bangladesh was treated uh, in the most restrictive category of nationals coming to invest in India. Mm. And nobody seemed to think it was necessary to change that. But yeah. the current government has changed that. And it has actually, through a somewhat convoluted framework, but essentially it has been done in a way that Bangladeshi citizens are now exempted from being included in a restricted list. Uh, <laughs> okay. We could have done it a more simple way. I, I would have preferred it a more simple way, but I'm sure there must have been good good reasons for it. The short point is that that particular situation no longer obtains, and I think we should indeed encourage Bangladeshi investment, including in things like real estate, etc., because it makes sense for for people on both sides to actually deploy capital uh, as as a long term stake in each other's country. And I see it purely from that perspective. Investment by Indians in Bangladesh. Again, you're absolutely right. We could certainly do a lot more. And uh, I, I would say Indian uh, businesses, we'd be more than happy to help them come here. Uh, we, we, are, we have plans to try and organize with our uh, chambers of commerce, industry-specific opportunities to showcase uh, business in Bangladesh. I would say if we can move forward on two quick things that are could be potential game changers. One is... The, the two um, uh, export processing zones that are to come up in Mirsarai and uh, Mongla, one by the Adani Group and one by the Hiranandani Group, if those can be moved forward by our two companies quickly, uh, those would offer an opportunity for Indian companies to plug and play very fast. Because uh, admittedly, land acquisition in Bangladesh is, is difficult. It is, as I said, a congested country, lots of people in a very small space. But the broad value proposition in Bangladesh is a, is a good one. And their investment authority has been very good in terms of being able to actually try and offer one single window clearances and to help affect uh, plug and play opportunities, at least in export promotion zones. So in at least the four or five sectors that I identified, agriculture and food processing, farm, machi farm machinery and, um, and tractors, mechanization of agriculture, seeds, fisheries in the broad sort of food basket and food processing. If we can bring companies in here, there are incentives that the agriculture minister and the trade minister have been very keen to offer. So Indian companies could come in and actually make, uh, you know, make a move very fast in this. FinTech and startups, there is huge opportunities as Bangladesh is moving up that value chain. And India is a natural partner there given the commonalities of cultural preference, etc. Automobiles, there is a new automobile policy. Bangladesh is moving away from reconditioned cars uh, to, uh, to actually trying to start having assembly of vehicles there um, in this country. This is an opportunity again for SIAM and for ACMA. Um, we have to remember that in terms of the LCV and the truck portion, we already command a huge, I mean, uh, almost complete market share, as well as in the two wheeler section. So, it is logical for us to actually see this as the next bridgehead into the Bangladesh market by actually getting into components and getting into some level of, uh, of higher order assembly in Bangladesh. Uh, and finally, machinery. 
I think the machinery opportunity as Bangladesh seeks to go beyond RMGs alone is again a huge opportunity. So, you know, if we could just start with these three or four sectors, mm -hmm. I think the returns will be adequate to incentivize others to come in here. Thank you, Thank you Vikram. I, you know, I can uh, only vouch for the attractiveness of Bangladesh as a market from our own company's experience. We've been uh, active in Bangladesh for maybe 20 years, and it's for the last, I'd say, five years, it's been our largest single export market. Um, and it's a market that's growing. It's increasingly quality conscious. Um, it's, yes, dominated by the uh, garment industry, but it's a, it's a very attractive market. I mean, without question, I think everyone, any, any, any good Indian company should be in Bangladesh. <laughs> so I could just add a point, which I yeah. forgot. Hmm. If you're looking at the FMCG sector, um, I, I don't know if the company would want me to mention it, so I won't mention the name, but there is one Indian company that has done brilliantly out here. It's been here like you for about 20 years. Yes. They've got two manufacturing units. They've reinvested profits. They are a big player when it comes to CSR. So they're on the right side of the public equation. And in their own estimate, uh, they are now, uh, and from what I hear from the Bangladeshis, uh, the there is uh, they are they are able to sort of forecast a comfortable sixteen plus percent uh, CAGR on the FMCG market. So the FMCG sector alone is driving a huge amount of consumption, right. and the prices are so much higher than in India. So the profitability is is almost assured. So I I I really can't see why more Indian companies wouldn't come. Thank you, thank you. So. You know, one of the uh, one of the questions that we have from the floor actually is, uh, and I'll just read it out. It's an interesting question. It says, you know, can you throw some light on how Bangladesh has succeeded in creating uh, such a successful textile and garment industry? Hmm. Uh, you know, and where and it's sort of added that it says, you know, where we are struggling, uh, and it says, you know, JICA did help them, but the same here is not successful. And uh, and I wondered, you know, if you could point to. Uh, Sorry, uh, if, you could, if you could point to some of the factors underlying the success of Bangladesh with the garment industry, you know, it's this really successful. Right, I see the question. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Look, uh, I think it it's uh, not fair on Bangladesh to give credit so much to JICA for that. Yes. I think it was sound policies to start with. Uh, most of all, from the with the with the understanding that Bangladesh's. Uh, uh, economy, you know, needed to be able to grow on the basis of the one thing that it did have a lot of, which was people. And uh, a number of sound policy choices were made, for instance, um, in not reserving it for the small scale sector. So when the multi-fiber agreement was phased out, Bangladesh was ready to make the quick jump into large, um, you know, large uh, manufacturing into, in terms of the number of people it employed, etc. We I mean, I don't know how, how politically appropriate it is for me to say it, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, we, we maintained the, the restrictions on the growth of our RNG sector for far too long. Uh, I don't know, I'm no expert on the subject, and I will leave that to the uh, textiles ministry to decide. I don't know now in today's pricing uh, and highly competitive market where, you know, every cent matters per shirt or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, whether, whether it is the market is going to constrict further or whether there is an opportunity for us to actually see it expand. But in my understanding, it makes complete sense for us to anchor our fabric and yarn and cotton in uh, growth in Bangladesh, because I don't see the Bangladesh RMG uh, sector fading away in any hurry. In fact, Bangladesh and Vietnam will continue to dominate the global manufacturing uh, sector here in terms of RMG manufacturing. And it probably makes sense for us to leverage growth that way, rather than to try and you know compete in a very big way at this point of time. We have our sectors of, of strength between you know knits and so on and so forth, but I I think it will be a relative exercise, and that uh, cost cost comparison, cost benefit analysis comparison, somebody in the textiles ministry should be doing. But I think the um, the sort of primary fact was that Bangladesh focused on allowing this industry to grow fast and in providing it the necessary incentives to grow. And remember, they did this without having cotton in, in country, without having, uh, you know, design, for design schools, etc. 
all of this they did by welcoming investors. The first Korean investors were here in the 70s. Ironically, one of them was one that was driven away uh, by from from India. Uh, I know the man. He told me that he would have been in India had it not been for the fact that he was driven away, including at one point at the point of a gun. So not exactly what you would call the best way of ensuring that we could grow. Thank you. You know, it's one of the one of the other factors I know has been uh, women entering the workforce in Bangladesh and uh, participating so actively in the garment industry. I mean, you know, the, the great bulk of um, of uh, people employed in the garment industry in Bangladesh are women. And this has had all kinds of beneficial consequences, even socially for the country. So it's it's a it's a success story for us to indeed learn from and replicate. I I, I fully agree with you. We should see the same thing happening in in Odisha and in uh, Chhattisgarh and in you know so many parts in the northeast. You know so many parts of the country. Very much so. Uh, uh, Vikram, I wonder. A comment or a question? Sorry. <laughs> sure. Yes. Is that a comment or a question? I, about... Oh no no that was a comment. That was a comment. Sorry sorry sorry. Uh, so 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 uh, the. Uh, the, a, que a question actually around China. Um, you know, China has been expanding its footprint in uh, in our region very uh, very significantly uh, in Sri Lanka, of course, but also in Bangladesh by uh, getting Bangladesh to participate in the BRI initiative and uh, and so on. Um, and uh, I understand that Bangla that that Bangladesh now also has a larger trading relationship in total. Uh, with China than it has with us in India. And we're, you know, right next door. We are all around Bangladesh in, uh, in many ways. And, uh, and I wonder, uh, you know, I'm not so concerned about what China does in Bangladesh. I'm more concerned about uh, us, the same point, tapping into the opportunities in Bangladesh uh, that you pointed to. Um, and your connectivity point, I thought was really important because um, which other country has the opportunity of, connect, you know, Bangladesh has no, well, has essentially no other neighbors. Uh, you know, it's a, we're, we're, we're their dominant land neighbor. Uh, and uh, we have this huge opportunity to connect with Bangladesh. Um, you know, and I think the numbers that you gave us were absolutely amazing in terms of the potential benefits of better connectivity on trade between the two countries and how both countries would see huge increases and huge improvements in uh, in our ability to export. What what comes in the way for really opening this up? I mean, um, you know, what could we, what should, what would you like to see us do? You know, what can we do to move it up the priority list? Uh, you know, is it, is this a, is this a problem with state governments? Uh, or is this a problem? This is this something that needs to be moved faster with the union government, um, or is this a problem where the Bangladeshi government needs to move or all of the above? <laughs> uh, and, uh, unfortunately, the lazy uh, answer is also the right answer, which is all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. Uh, <laughs> uh, tragically, because uh, look, um, to be clear here, let's let's unpack that a bit further. Mm. Right. First of all. You're absolutely right. Uh, we should focus on what we need to do and not get caught up with what others are doing. I think that is not a sensible approach to dealing with our neighbors um, for a variety of reasons. And you know, we don't even need to elaborate on that. Uh, our interests in Bangladesh are our own. And we need to be clear that whatever happens in our neighborhood, we have no way to go to. In other words, there's no going away if something goes wrong for us, right? So. If that is our understanding, then it makes complete sense for us to be as fully engaged in the Bangladesh development story as it is humanly possible. There was a question here on the uh, chat box, for instance, somebody was asking about urban solutions. I didn't list it, but of course I could list everything. There's everything that we can do in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is undergoing an unprecedented urbanization, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, urbanization at an unprecedented pace, which is, similar to the processes that are happening in India. Now, it is happening at a pace at which, you know, the regulatory systems cannot cope. So there are huge opportunities for us to be part of 
a range of activities, range, uh, you know, including, for instance, um, waste management. RMG is leading to a lot of uh, waste, uh, waste pollution, uh, chemical pollution, and uh, tanneries are leading to chemical pollution. All of this into the rivers, which is Bangladesh's great wealth, right? We could be part of those solutions. There's a business opportunity, not as a not as charity. They, they don't need the charity. They want the business opportunity. Smart electric, uh, smart uh, smart lighting solutions, intelligent metering solutions, uh, urban architecture uh, solutions. There are Bangladeshi companies that are more than ready to partner us if we would just step up and make the effort. Mm -hmm. So you know, those opportunities will come to us if we if we just keep coming here and knocking on the doors. It is an amazing fact that we hardly have business delegations coming here. And that, you know, in a sense, I should also uh, address a question from uh, one of my uh, former bosses who's also on the, who's also typed something here, when he says, how do we work to change mindsets? And that is the fundamental point, as Ambassador Raghavan asks here. Unless we start looking at Bangladesh, the way we would look at a business opportunity if it was, say, you know, a thousand kilometers away from our borders, uh, purely as a business opportunity and not getting caught up with the fact that it is culturally similar or, uh, you know, historically connected, et cetera, et cetera. Focus on it as a business opportunity. Let's not get too caught up with the shared history that we have if you're coming here to do business. That is the delta. That's the advantage that you get on top. It's a cherry on the top. But as one of our very perceptive former uh, diplomats has once said, there's nothing scarier in our neighborhood than our going around telling everybody that we're just the same. It's fine for them to tell us this. It's <laughs> yes. not so good for them to, for us to be telling them that. It brings up all the wrong, uh, wrong uh, notions. So focus on Bangladesh as a business opportunity. Come here and do business. It, it works just that simply. In the RMG sector today, there are at least 50 Indian, Indian, Indian companies, which are actually you know, they are called Bangladeshi companies. They may be JVs or they're just owned by Indians, but they're registered out here. They've been doing business since the 1990s. Yes. And they're doing excellent business out here. So there is a way of doing business here. It is not too dissimilar from doing business in India. So just focus on doing business here. Let's not get um, mm. too carried away with first trying to fix, uh, fix everything and then coming here because that's not the way the Koreans or the Chinese or anybody else is coming here. Um, your second part, what can we do in terms of actual policy issues? As I've been saying on our side, we need to, my personal view, get out of the mindset that everything will be done reciprocally. Um, if you look at the border, for instance, um, there are infrastructure development activities that we should do in any case, whether or not the Bangladeshis choose to do so. So improving facilities at land crossings, land custom stations, and immigration check posts is a net benefit irrespective. You should do it whether they do it or not, right? Treating people better when they cross the border is just in your benefit. Reducing um, you know, the, the sort of arduous processing that people have to go through when they're coming with passports and visas doesn't really help create Binas friends uh, in, in Bangladesh, right? And I'm sure it applies to other countries too. Um, at the union level, as I said, fixing the small issues that, that irk, in particular in business terms, is a small matter, but it would have huge uh, payback in terms, of, in terms of driving the perception of India. Um, we need to be clear, we will not address every perception gap issue. Yeah. That I think it would be folly for us to say that if I fix problem A, everything will be all right. It will not be all right. We are, we do loom large on the mindsets of our neighbors, in particular in Bangladesh. So everything we do is disproportionately imbued with significance, which I'm pretty sure we, we didn't intend it as, right? But even if you do accept the fact that uh, you don't have, you, you can't address everything, addressing the smaller stuff, which facilitates business, which facilitates movement of people, is a major contributor to the improvement of perception, and if nothing else, it creates the business linkages and the personal linkages that will, you know, drive our relationship beyond the political level. Uh, our consistent approach at looking at the Bangladesh relationship purely as a political relationship is fundamentally problematic. It mm -hmm. needs to be looked at 
as a multi-dimensional relationship in which the future will be driven by those who are promoting the business angle of it. There's neighbors who do business together, whether the change of government's better, better also. I mean, you only have to look at the US and Mexico or the US and Canada or whatever. Yes. Uh, good trade, good investment, and good business is what has ensured that no matter which party is in power in any of these countries, they have to do business with each other. Thank you, Vikram. I think that was a that was a very powerful statement and a very, a very it gives us direction on what we must do. And I think your point about that we shouldn't keep harping on reciprocity in everything that we do. I mean, we should. This is where we, as the as the, this is where we should remind ourselves that we are the bigger country, uh, you know, and and say that as the bigger country we should move first. So I think it's indeed a a, a powerful argument, and I think us fixing things on the border and border crossing uh, is within our control. And the more we can do in that area, uh, I fully agree. I think the, the, the more powerful and beneficial all around. Uh, I, a, a, last, a last question actually, and I, I want to come back to the point on, um, uh, that uh, Ambassador Raghavan raised um, on uh, perceptions uh, and which you, which you, which you addressed uh, as well. Uh, but you know, when we were talking uh, last week, uh, one of the one of the uh, comments that you made that really struck me was you said, you know, there's this we somehow see Bangladesh as being um, Bengal, uh, and uh, that yes. that is too limiting. Instead of seeing Bangladesh as um, a self-respecting independent country uh, and a self-respecting independent country and a potential trading partner like any other self-respecting independent country. Uh, and I think you've you've made that point again just now. And I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it's a very important, powerful point. And it's one that uh, we all need to internalize in our own mindsets. Um, and I wonder any any further comments on that because I think it's such an important point because it's the it's the it's the big it's the big thing we need to get over to take our relationship uh, to fruition. Uh, <laughs> let me not get myself, I, well, maybe let me get myself into a little trouble. Let me say this directly. I think, look, I didn't want to make this an exegesis into history, but <laughs> we need to be clear that the, uh, the issue that we keep talking about mindset and worries and so on and so forth, as an ancient nation and a civilization, we shouldn't be blind to history. The partition in 1905 was welcomed in large parts of what is today's Bangladesh for a reason, right? And that mindset needs to be addressed, which is that we should not give the feeling that we don't treat Bangladesh as an equal, mm. or that we don't, don't respect uh, them as an independent country, or that we don't see them in some way as being, uh, how should I put it? Um, mm, um, worthy of our, uh, of our respect. Um, uh, that is problematic. And, you know, it, it takes, it takes very little to, uh, to treat people, uh, to treat people uh, nicely, the, to, to treat people the way we would like to be treated. Yes. And these are, after all, our neighbors. These are people for whom, you know, instinctively, we understand each other's way of thinking, way of speaking, food, etc. So it should not be so difficult for us to to uh, to offer them all that they're asking, which is to be treated the, the way we expect to be treated. It's it's in every religious book the idea of treating people the way you want to be treated uh, is sort of you know emphasized. Um, there is a second part to it. We also forget that Bangladesh, as I su suggested to you earlier, is not West Bengal, and equally for for uh, for Bangladeshis, that India is not West Bengal either, mm -hmm. uh, for better or for worse. Um, you know. We need to invest in ensuring that Bangladesh and India interact with other bits of each other. It's not just uh, a relationship between uh, people who speak Bangla. It has to be a relationship that is broader. So the expansion, for instance, of a Bangladeshi uh, post, I mean, a diplomatic post into Chennai is a very good thing. Uh, yeah. I don't say it because I'm a, because from my name, it's obvious I'm a South Indian. I'm not making, <laughs> I'm making the larger point that Bangladesh 
needs to know that there is a bit of India that is not culturally or otherwise directly connected with uh, with Bangladesh, and that there is a different perception of Bangladesh there, and that perception management can be done there too. That there is a west of a western part of India, that there is Punjab, where you know things are very different, and so that opportunity is important. The second part is to engage. The third part is to engage across states. I think state level engagement. Our northeastern states, for instance, are extremely keen on the opportunity that Bangladesh presents. Uh, Tripura has been, uh, and here's an, again an example of how um, business-related interests and economic interests trump everything else. Irrespective of the political party in part, Tripura has been a strong votary of good ties with Bangladesh. So I see this as an opportunity for us to also invest, as we have been trying to do in the last several years, to get the states more involved also in in the relationship with Bangladesh, because the states that surround Bangladesh are critical to Bangladesh's perception of India, whether we like it or not. So how we bring the states into play into this diplomacy in the neighborhood is critical. So these are, I think, three broadly fundamental points I'd like to make uh, without going further and getting myself into all sorts of trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think those, was, those were as forward looking as all your all your comments have been today. Uh, Vikram, you know, I know we could we could continue for a while, but I know our time is up. Um, the uh, I um, I just want to thank you most warmly, not only for being with us, but for giving us the direction you've given us, and not just the direction that you've given us in terms of things that we must go away and work on and do, but how we must think about the relationship what our conception of the relationship should be of what are how we should see bangladesh as a country and as an independent self-respecting country that wishes to deal with on an equal footing with us as a self-respecting independent country and i think uh, that direction is uh, is 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 essential to us uh, progressing our relationship as we as we can uh, there are many questions that we've not been able to address some of them are very specific. Um, and I think the points, you know, some of the questions on uh, people who are trying to do more in Bangladesh and how can the High Commission help, et cetera, I, I figure are best handled individually. Um, and uh, uh, there was a question for me as well from uh, one of your predecessors uh, as High Commissioner. And um, my, 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 my answer to that question is, that, uh, is, is something that I wanted to end with, which is to say that, uh, as soon as COVID permits, uh, I would be delighted to be part of an industry delegation to Bangladesh. Uh, we would love to come to Bangladesh uh, to bring as high as high powered a group as we can uh, from India Great. and in industry to Bangladesh. And we will keep coming um, to ensure that uh, we expand our uh, expand our activity in Bangladesh, really, really see Bangladesh as this land of opportunity uh, for us to do much more uh, together. So uh, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a commitment from my side to you, Vikram, and I hope that COVID will permit, uh, permit us to, to do this as soon as, as, soon as we can. Um, and while we continue to be as fortunate as to have you as our representative uh, and our owner of this relationship. So just thank you very much indeed uh, again for your time with us today. Not owner, just account manager. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are far too many people who own it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for the opportunity. Much. And if I may, uh, I also want to thank the many people who have uh, sent messages. I've been trying to respond to them individually. I hope <laughs> to try and respond um, over the course of whatever time is, is available after after we they all log off. So thank, thank you so you. much. And thank you we, very just, much. Uh, just a commitment. If any businesses want to uh, look at the market and are interested in sending a delegation here, please let us know. E email email us at our commercial office, which is com c o m one, which is the digit one dot dhaka at mea dot gov dot in. That's c o m. That's Charlie uh, Oliver Mike one dot dhaka at mea.gov.in. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thank you. We'll thank do you our very best much to put indeed, our efforts where my mouth is. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much indeed again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.